turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm number 33. Psalm chapter number 33. We're going to be looking down at verses 6 through 11 as we get started tonight. Psalm chapter 33 and verse number 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heat. He layeth up the deep depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. How do we know the Bible is true? Now, there are a lot of different ways that we can know how the Bible is true. I'm going to list a couple of them here real quick. The Bible says it is true. It self-identifies as being true. It is historically accurate. If we look at the history that it conveys... It's valid history. It's what happened. And we can see it. It is scientifically accurate. It's not a science book, but if we look at the things that it has to say about science, it is accurate in those things that it has to say about science. It has no mistakes in it. It describes a consistent universe. Its prophecies have come true. Those things that it said... This is going to happen, you know, sometimes it'll give a date, sometimes it'll give a range of time, but it's, it predicts things, and it has prophecies, and those prophecies have come true. And then it's changed lives. We can look all around, and we can see people whose lives are changed because of the Bible. And then, how do I know the Bible is true? It's changed my life. I personally have a life that has been changed by the Bible. So these are all, and there's other things that we could look at and we could talk about as ways, things that we can look at to know the Bible is true. Today, I want to focus on just one of these things, and that is the consistency of the universe. So let's pray and ask God to help us as we look at this. Dear Lord, I pray that you help me as I seek to show what the scripture has to say about how you provide for the consistency of our universe. Please help me, I pray, and I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So, I have here a box. And this box was designed to hold an NVMe M.2 SSD drive. It's a computer part. You don't need to know what this is. It's a box, okay? So, if I were to say, in this box is a computer part. And then I told you, in this box, there is no computer part. It doesn't have any computer parts in it. So, so I said, there is a computer part in here. And I said, there is not a computer part in here. Now, can these things both be true? No. Can there both be a computer part in here and no computer part in here? No, those things can't both be true. Why? Why? So there is a law of logic that is called the law of non-contradiction that says if you make two contradictory claims, they can't both be true. Or it's, it actually, the more succinct version is any contradiction is false. Any contradiction is false. Either one statement is true, or the other statement is true. Because they are contradictory statements, they can't both be true. So, Pastor Price is younger than I am. I was born in December of 1977. He was born in June of 1978. Okay, so Pastor Price is younger than him. Well, if I was to tell you that I am younger than Pastor Price, or Pastor Price is older than I am. Would that be true? No, it would not be true. 
because they can't both be true. He can't be both older than me and younger than me. I can't be both older than him and younger than him. He's about to turn the same year number age, but if you look at the months and the days and everything, he's always going to be younger than I am. I am always going to be older than he is. To deny the law of non-contradiction requires the law to be true. So if someone says, no, 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 I don't believe in the law of non-contradiction. So then they're saying something can both be true and not true at the same time. And I said, okay, so you're telling me that it can't be true that the law of non-contradiction is true. So therefore, I, since I believe in the law of con non-contradiction, you're saying, therefore, what I believe can also be true. And if what I believe is also true, then yours can't be true. So it's a self-defeating sort of uh, circular logic that they create when they say the law of non-contradiction can't be true. And it's like if I were to take a piece of paper and I were to write a sentence on it and I gave it to Josiah here and I said, Josiah, I want you to follow the instructions on this piece of paper exactly. Do exactly what the piece of paper says. And then I wrote one sentence on here and it said, do not read this sentence. <laughs> I have given him an impossibility. If, if he, I give it to him and he tries to follow the instructions, he'll read it and suddenly he will have not followed the instructions because I would have given him an impossible thing to do. Most people never think about why contradictions can't both be true. Most people never think about that. But as a Christian, we can answer why contradictions can't be true. Why the law of non-contradiction is a good law of logic. God is the source of all truth, wisdom, and knowledge. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Colossians 2, 3 says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So God is the source of all truth. If we want truth, we need to look for God for that truth. Then... God cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So God is going to be true to his nature. He's not going to deviate from who he is. He's not going to become something, that, something else. He's always going to be true to what he is. And... He is truth, so therefore he's always going to continue to be truth. Since God is truth, and God cannot deny himself, therefore truth will not contradict itself. Hebrews 1.3a says, Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So God upholds all things by the words of his power, and that includes logic and the ability to think logically. It includes truth. Therefore, it includes the law of non-contradiction. And then God made us in his image. Genesis 1.26a says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God made us like him in a limited sense, and gave us the ability to think logically. So the laws of logic are a reflection of the way God thinks. If the Bible weren't true, we would have no way to explain why contradictions are false. Even people who don't believe the Bible agree in the law of non-contradiction 
but they don't have a logical way to explain why they believe that. Now, there are lots of other logic laws, and we're not going to look at a whole bunch of other logic laws. I just want to mention two other ones that kind of go along with this one, the law of non-contradiction. And that is the law of the excluded middle, and that says uh, something must um, be true or not be true. Um, for example, if I said this box exists and this box does not exist, there's no in-between in that. Well, it kind of exists and kind of doesn't exist. No, it either exists or it doesn't exist, the excluded middle. And then there's the law of identity that says something is what it is. So I say, this is a box, that is a wall, that means that is not a box and this is not a wall. It's the law of identity. So these are a few of the basic laws by which we can um, make valid arguments about things and we can reason. So our, uh, our first way that we can see the consistency of the universe is in logic. So the next thing I'd like to look at is the universe is consistent in reliability. And that's kind of just another way of rephrasing the word, rewording the word consistent. Um, we all have an idea of what gravity is. Einstein described it in his general theory of relativity as a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the uneven distribution of mass. And I like to read that sort of thing when I was younger, and so that is a really fascinating definition to me and I love all the pictures that show a three-dimensional grid and a little indentation of it in the grid uh, to show the space-time distortion that occurs just so we can understand it better but uh, gravity is the weakest of the four fundamental forces strong force electromagnetic force and it is even weaker than the weak force that is one of those four forces <clears throat> Um, but it is easier to understand and is well approximated by Newton's law of universal gravitation, which describes gravity as a force which causes any two bodies to be attracted to each other with a force proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So, to stop getting so close to a science class, though, I'll just say, in other words, Bigger things attract more, and if you put something farther away, it's going to attract less. So gravity does uh, lots of things for us. It gives weight to objects. When I pick up something, it, it has a weight to it, and that's because of gravity. Gravity describes why the moon revolves around the Earth, why the Earth revolves around the sun. It describes and explains how the moon causes the ocean tides. And it describes how if I take something and I let go of it, that it's going to drop to the floor. So we can all agree that gravity exists. But why does it exist? And I'm not asking, a, oh, do you believe there are gravitons that which cause gravity on, the, you know, and look deeper into the to the realm of physics. No, I'm not asking that question. I'm asking, well, well, why? Why does gravity exist? And furthermore, how do we know that it's the same for everything? You know, I, I have a phone here, but if we get another phone and we drop it, will it drop the same way? Yeah. What if we get a hundred different phones and we drop all hundred different phones up here? Will they all drop the same? Will gravity work the same for everything? And then, how do we know, if I, if I take this phone, you know, Pastor and Mrs. Price, they took a bunch of teens, they had some phones probably with them. If they took their phones, how do we know that if they drop their phones up there, that they'll drop just like ours do here? It's a, it's a totally different place, you know, it's way up there. You know, how do we know if we, we took this phone to the moon, that it would drop on the moon. 
how, how, do, how do we know that? And then, how do we know that if I drop this tomorrow, it's going to fall, just like it drops today? And how do we know about next year? Is it going to drop the same way next year as it drops today? How do we know there's any consistency to that? Well, the Bible tells us that God is consistent. He doesn't lie or change his nature. First Samuel 15, 29 says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God is going to do exactly what he said he will do. He is consistent. Because God is consistent, the things he creates are consistent. So if we could find something and identify it as God didn't create this, well, we might have a reason to believe that they might not be consistent, but good for us, God created everything. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John 1.3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So God made the atoms that make up this phone. God made the atoms that make up your phones. And so we know that any number of phones that we get, the law of gravity will be consistent between them. And then, because God is omnipresent, the universe is consistent everywhere God is. Psalm 139, verse 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Because God is both here and in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, we know that anyone who has a phone there, and if they... Let go of it in the air. It's going to drop there just like it's going to drop here. Because God is there just as much he, as he is here. So his laws, his rules, gravity in this case, are going to apply just as much. And then God is not restricted by time. The universe will be just as consistent today as it will be tomorrow. 2 Timothy 1.9 who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Titus 1.2 In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. God promised the hope of eternal life before the world began. Ephesians 1.4, not only that, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He didn't just say, I'm going to give you the opportunity for eternal life and have that before the foundation of the world. He also wants us to be holy and without blame before him in love. 1 Peter 1.20 Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Psalm 102 verse 27 But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. So, God is not restricted by time, therefore we can expect the universe to be consistent, these laws like gravity, to be consistent throughout time. The consistency of the universe allows us to do experiments and expect to get the same results given the same conditions. It allows us to know what time we need to leave somewhere to get there on time. Um, it allows us to know if 
we get a cake mix and we look at the instructions and we follow the instructions and do what it says that we will get a consistent output at the cake. We will get a cake that tastes good. It allows us to know how much gas we need to put in our car so we can make it to our destination. Everything in our life um, requires the consistency of the universe in order for us to know things, to be able to do things. It allowed the Apollo 15 astronauts to take a hammer and a feather to the moon and drop them and observe that they fell at the same rate. Because God is the same, his laws work the same everywhere. So, the universe is consistent in logic, the universe is consistent in reliability, and the universe is consistent in morality. If, if I stole Andrew's car, I think all of you agree with me, that would be a bad thing for me to do. If I wrote the, my, a wrong name, or gave wrong information on a government form I was filling out, I think you would all agree that would be a bad thing for me to do. Or if, um, if I were to take my van and drive it through the front door of Safeway tonight, I think you would all agree with me that would be a bad thing on all sorts of levels. That would be a horrible thing for me to do. We are able to answer these questions because of the existence of morality. Why are some things right and some things wrong? That's what morality is. Morality says some things are right and some things are wrong. But why, why does that exist? Why does that exist where some things are right and some things are wrong? Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. So, everything in our world is God's. It is owned by God. It was created by God. It is owned by God. Therefore, God has the right to make the rules. He has the right to determine what is right and what is wrong. Now, some people would tell you, well, you can't tell someone what is right and what is wrong. And in doing so, they are citing their own morality to say, you can't have your morality. Because they're saying it is wrong for me to say, this is right and that is wrong. Therefore, they are defining a wrong and saying, that they are in the right and I am in the wrong. And so they're imposing their morality on me. So you can't, you can't do a logic from that perspective. You also can't do it from a group perspective. If all of us got together here in this room and we all said, yes, it is a right thing for me to steal Andrew's car. Would it be a right thing for me to steal Andrew's car? No, it still wouldn't be a right thing. Because what this group decides is right can't be a basis for right and wrong. And even if this whole group decided, yes, that's wrong, and then you could have another group, and they're the same size, they could decide, well, it's a wrong thing, and you're just back to the same place. You just have a larger group of people. So you have to appeal to a higher authority than any group of people. You have to have a principle that's going to, uh, that you're going to come from that's going to give you that. Right and wrong exist because God determines what is right and what is wrong. And then each person can choose to do right or choose to do wrong based on God's standard. And uh, we know that God has set forth his standard of morality in the Bible, and we can look and see what God has to say about certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong from what the Bible has to say. But he has also written it into our existence. Our very existence 
is uh, our very selves, our, our mind, our conscience, is written in the thought that there is a right and that there is a wrong. Romans chapter 2, and uh, I think this would be a good one for if, if you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 2. And you can look at these words. Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, if you'd like to turn to it. The Bible says there, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. And then verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, they meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So God gave us a conscience that if we do something, that conscience rings a bell in our mind and says, that's wrong, or that's right, that's wrong or that's right. God gave us that knowledge that there is a right and there is a wrong. Even an unbeliever has a sense of morality because God wrote it in their hearts. And the Bible tells us that at some point we have all done something wrong. We have all done something contrary to God's standard for morality. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God tells us that the punishment for this sin, this wrong that we have done, is death. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God paid for our sin with his death. But God commendeth his love toward us, Romans 5, 8 says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gives us a way to accept his payment for our sin and have eternal life. Romans 10, 9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. So, only the Bible tells us why contradictions are false. Only the Bible tells us why the universe is reliable. Only the Bible tells us why morality exists. And only the Bible can tell us how to know God, how to accept His salvation, and how to live with Him forever. Colossians 1, verse 16 to 17 says, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. That sounds like these things that we've been talking about. Invisible things, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you for scripture that shows us what our universe is like and who you are. I thank you for revealing yourself to us and giving us the opportunity to know you. And I pray that you would help us to seek to know you more each and every day. I ask in Jesus' name. Are dismissed.